WNBC for New York. And now, this is News for New York. Good evening, I'm Carol Jenkins. Ralph Penza is off tonight. From Manhattan to the Middle East, the hunt for answers into the World Trade Center bombing intensifies. Tonight, the latest on several fronts. Three men arrested yesterday are released. We'll trace the Middle East roots of the prime suspect, Mohammed Salome. And we'll have the latest live from the site of the blast as investigators inch ever closer to ground zero. First, the latest on the investigation. Federal agents have unleashed a global dragnet for suspects in the bombing. Steve Dawson joins us with the latest developments in the case. Steve. Well, Carol, the first order of business involves the three men arrested by the FBI last night outside of Brooklyn Mosque. Today, they were released. The U.S. attorney has declined to prosecute them on stolen car charges. But for the first time, we know who Mohammed Salome is and where he hails from. 25-year-old Mohammed Salome continues to be the government's prime suspect in the World Trade Center bombing. With Salome being held without bond, investigators are attempting to further link him to the explosion through physical evidence, as well as his associates, past and present. Today, the government of Jordan confirmed that Salome is a native Palestinian with a Jordanian passport. He was born in September 1967 in the village of Badia on the Israeli-occupied West Bank. A spokesman in Amman said Salome has no previous criminal record, but promised the Jordanian government has begun an investigation of its own into Salome's past. Friday night, agents raided a storage locker in New Jersey rented by Salome. In it, they found 100 pounds of sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and urea, chemicals which can be used to make a bomb. They removed the explosive chemicals and later detonated them at Liberty Park in Jersey City. On the day of Salome's arrest, investigators had also found bomb-making equipment during a search of the Palestinians' apartment. And among the things recovered were tools and wiring and manuals concerning antenna, circuitry, and electromagnetic devices. Agents also found traces of nitrate on the rental papers used by Salome at a New Jersey rental car agency where Salome rented a van allegedly used in the explosion. So with all the progress that's been made so far, agents say the motive for this bombing remains unclear, although a Palestinian connection does seem to be emerging. Carol? Steve, very briefly, what do you make of the re releasing of these uh, three men uh, so suddenly? Well, it leads to a lot of speculation that perhaps the stolen car charges wouldn't hold up, or perhaps they want to keep an eye on them, and uh, the stolen car charges is not the way they chose to do it. So m more maybe in the offing. Maybe. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. Well, at the site of the blast, the digging, the sifting, and the search for more clues continue tonight as investigators close in on Ground Zero. Kevin Rosen joins us live from the World Trade Center. Kevin. Carol, out of the tons of rubble below the World Trade Center came one small piece of evidence that cracked this case wide open. And one of the investigators being credited with finding that uh, piece of evidence is a New York City police officer who refused to take any personal glory, calling the discovery a team effort. New York City Police Lieutenant Donald Sadawi is one member of a team of bomb squad investigators who picked a small piece of metal out of the tons of rubble. That small piece was the vehicle identification number of the rider truck that cracked this case wide open. Lieutenant Sadawi and fellow investigators from the FBI and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms have not stopped their search for clues. There's, there's still a tremendous amount of work to, to be done uh, in, in a lot of areas, whether it's at the investigative scene or follow-up investigations. Our particular job here with everybody here is the, is the scene investigation and providing the information we find here to the investigative teams. Investigators have not yet reached the bottom of the hole created by the blast. These new pictures of the crater show you just how much work still has to be done before any search for a missing person or investigation of the tons of rubble below can begin. Port Authority engineers are feverishly working to shore up the damage. The safety of the worker is paramount. So obviously we, we got the lateral bracing. Now we have a better ability to survey the perimeter, develop t techniques on how to do that. And a week is a good guess as far as having a hole through the plaza, having a crane down, being able to access and take material out. So it could be about a week before investigators get to the point that uh, has been called ground zero. It is there that uh, may be more clues to this case and quite possibly the body of a man who has been missing and feared dead since the blast last Friday. Carol? Kevin, thanks very, very much. 
Moving on to other stories near Waco, Texas, a cult and its leader are still under siege tonight. Federal agents are maintaining their vigil outside the armed camp, not knowing what's going on inside or when the standoff will end. Mark Strassman joins us live from the scene. Mark. Good evening, Carol. The feds are getting a much better sense of David Koresh, the control freak, and you can tell they're getting frustrated and fed up with it. Their tone toward him has become much more aggressive, although it's still a long way from anywhere near hostile. From the cult compound today, nothing. No sign of conciliation. Not even another released child. David Koresh's almost daily token gesture for most of this week. Without question, it's Koresh's control over the adults that gives the feds fits. We have our beliefs that there are people who would willingly walk out if they were allowed to do so. We are trying to appeal to Mr. Koresh to let those people go who want to go. But for now, no one's going anywhere. Trying to get rest of them break here and so they can have a time off. In just a week, an entire community's grown up in the shadow of the compound. We've got uh, enough to satisfy 96 lines. And keeps wiring itself for more growth around the clock. In fact, I think we have some people out here like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning putting in line. And on the subject of communications, on some levels, negotiators must be faltering. The feds have started talking directly to technology on television, sometimes over the head of David Koresh to his followers, and sometimes right to him. If he is listening, we want to give him and his followers our assurance that he and everyone inside will be treated fairly and humanely if they come out. This was really another bleak day for progress in the, in the stalemate. Uh, about the brightest note I heard all day was the fact that David Koresh is finally asking negotiators about the judicial process, about how he'd be treated if he came out, and about how his supporters would be treated if they came out, which at least means he's thinking about it. Reporting live from Waco, Texas, I'm Mark Strassman, News 4. Let's go back to Carol in the studio. Mark, if you can hear me, I would like to ask you one question. I, I guess this sense that he is uh, asking uh, what would seem like sensible questions, uh, is there any understanding there that he's actually considering it or just buying time? Yeah, that's a very good question, Carol. Uh, the feds are playing for time here. They basically think that time is in their favor. They believe that for most people, at least, over time, they grow less emotional and more rational. They think if they can wait him out, eventually he'll come around. But it's very hard to figure out exactly what's going through Koresh's mind here, whether he's just posturing or whether he's sincerely interested in how he'd be treated if he and his supporters came out. And is there still fear that uh, he is plotting a suicide pact along with his followers and that will include the children who are still inside? He has told negotiators that he is considering suicide neither for himself nor for any of his followers. And at this point, I don't think negotiators have much, uh, much else uh, luck other than to take him at his word. Mark, thank you very, very much. A rally for the Reverend Al Sharpton was called off at the last minute today when supporters learned he may not be spending as much time in jail as planned. Corrections officials say he may begin a work release program as soon as Monday. Supporters plan to head to Rikers Island to visit Mr. Sharpton today, but plans changed at the last minute when they found he had been moved to the Brooklyn House of Atten Detention. Sharpton was sentenced to 45 days because of his role in the so-called Day of Outrage protest in 1987. Sharpton and others blocked rush hour traffic in defiance of a court order to protest then the bias-related death of a young black man. Sharpton's attorney, Michael Hardy, says his client was moved because he was causing a commotion at Rikers Island. He says the inmates see Sharpton as an advocate on their behalf. Well, Mayor Dinkins has jumped into the stormy search for a new chancellor of New York City schools. As Chancellor Joseph Fernandez wraps up his contract in June, the Board of Education is forming a search committee to find his replacement. Last month, the board voted 4-3 to three to oust Fernandez in a furor over teaching students about gay lifestyles and condoms. The mayor is reportedly concerned those divisions and the upcoming mayoral election could hamper the recruiting of a successor. The mayor and three of the five borough presidents have nominated 20 prominent figures, including financier Felix Rowatin, to be considered for the seven-member search committee. But we have much more ahead for you on News 4. President Clinton takes to the airwaves to defend his economic plan. One of the silver screen's most popular leading ladies is fighting for her life tonight. 
The storm that brought coastal flooding to New Jersey and New York slams Connecticut with record snow. And Ira, is there more stormy weather for us on the way? Well, not in the immediate future, but toward the end of the five-day period, perhaps, Carol, stay tuned. We have your forecast straight ahead right here on News 4 New York. Stay with us. And here's... to fly from over here to over there, then you should know that only one airline flies you non-stop to the most cities from over here to over there. And since that one and only airline is Delta, you know you'll be getting the warmest, most personal service in the sky on your way over, over there. Delta, we love to fly, and it shows the world over. Well, on the air this morning, President Clinton continued to lobby for his economic plan. He told radio listeners that this week's slight improvement in the nation's jobless rate is not enough. Unemployment is still higher than it was at the depths of this recession. And most of the new jobs being created pay part-time wages and rarely provide workers with the health care coverage families need. If this anemic recovery is the best we can do, it's further proof that real changes are needed to produce a better economy and a better life for our people. But in a Republican response, Alaska Senator Ted Stevens criticized the Clinton program as a new social agenda to be paid for with new taxes. Two Oscar-winning leading ladies who live in New York much of the year are hospitalized this weekend. First, Katherine Hepburn. Ms. Hepburn, shown in a 1991 interview, is in Hartford Hospital for tests. She starred with greats like Cary Grant and Spencer Tracy in Adam's Rib in The Philadelphia Story and on Golden Pond. Her brother-in-law, Ellsworth Grant, said the 85-year-old actress was admitted Thursday for exhaustion. And Claudette Colbert, who made her name in sophisticated comedies in the 30s and 40s, is in serious condition at a Barbados hospital. Officials say she suffered a stroke on Tuesday. Now 89, she won an Oscar in 1934 for It Happened One Night with Clark Gable. Miss Colbert makes her home part of the year in the Caribbean. Well, the big storm that swept across the eastern seaboard has left a lot of problems in its wake. After days of rain, the Potomac River is swollen beyond its banks. It crested this afternoon at over 12 feet, at least two feet above flood stage. Many areas bordering the river in Maryland and Virginia have been flooded. U.S. Park Service officials are warning of dangerous conditions for any river activities. Nearby in Connecticut, the storm system brought snow. It dumped up to 15 inches in some areas. Police are warning motorists of hazardous driving conditions and report more than 100 auto accidents. And in Maine, most of the state is covered with at least half a foot of snow, with two feet in some western and mountain areas. Great for skiers, but heavy winds blew drifts around, creating major headaches for motorists. Well, there may be some more snow added to that soon. Ira Joe will have that forecast for us shortly. Also still ahead on News 4, we'll take you to Chile, Alaska, as the annual Iditarod sl uh, dog sled race gets underway. And there were no dogs in sight as the cats took over at Madison Square Garden. And does Ira have a perfect forecast? We'll find out next. It was time for the kids to see America, from sea to shining sea, that sort of thing. So I planned it all very carefully, because we're not exactly made of money, but it was all the little things I hadn't planned that made the trip. Sure, we had a great time at all those theme parks, but we'd already been on the biggest ride of all. Bills, bills, and more bills. More than you can handle? If you're a homeowner, call Statewide Capital at 1-800-DIAL-CASH and consolidate them into one low-cost home equity loan. Even if you've been turned down at the bank, you can lower your monthly payments. Your interest may be tax deductible. Then get just one monthly bill. Make one low payment. For a better tomorrow, dial cash today. Every Mercury Cougar XR7 has a wild new interior. It offers over $800 more in added features at no added charge. And right now, you can lease Cougar for only $2.99 a month for 24 months with just $1,500 down, which makes Cougar a practical indulgence. You simply have to have. The new Cougar XR7. Catch one now at your Lincoln Mercury dealer.
Well, it's a three-dog night in Alaska as sled teams set off at the start of the 21st annual Iditarod race. About 1,300 Huskies and 69 contestants are mushing through more than 1,100 miles of frozen landscape tonight. The bone-chilling journey takes about 10 days, and the marathon racers say the stiff competition could snowball into one exciting run. I hear of eight or nine teams that are supposed to be very, very... Go ahead. You can't single anybody out there. We all know the, the ultra competitive people are all going to be there and then some newcomers. Well, the Iditarod commemorates a life saving dog sled run of medicine to a remote gold mining community back in 1925. Looks sort of like Connecticut, huh? I was just going to say that. Yes, yeah. indeed. They could have trained in Connecticut for the Iditarod. Lots of snow. Mm -hmm. uh, the bulk of it spared in our immediate area, but yes, farther you go in the nutmeg or Constitution State, take your pick. More snow doth fall from yon sky. But let's uh, concentrate on the New York City area right now, shall we? Outside our window, the temperature, hey, is not too bad. 40 degrees is our current temperature. We had a high today of 42, which was still four below what we normally get. Sky above is cloudy, and the rest of the statistics, wind from the west at six miles an hour. From the west, meaning with drier air. Humidity, 73%. Barometer rising right now, 29.84 inches. Deal is this. That storm to which we alluded only moments ago is now just a lumbering low that's moving across the northern Atlantic and high pressure building in in its wake. Initially, west winds with, as we say, drier air, but ultimately by tomorrow, briefly but nicely, milder southwest winds. As we said, the high was 42 and the low temperature in Central Park was 30 degrees and around the tri-state, darn proud temperatures. I could blush, they're so proud. Look at temperatures in the 30s and 40s. Tonight, though, they're going to slide back into the 20s hitting near 30 here in the city and we'll have that west wind persisting at 5 to 10 miles an hour but you heard it here perhaps some teens will be noted as well in the morning after a partly cloudy night we'll have a mostly sunny a.m. temperatures after that sun does rise at 621 will be in the 20s and 30s the west wind at 5 to 10 miles an hour will tomorrow during the day as we say become a southwest wind at 5 to 10 miles an hour we'll see temperatures rising into the 40s maybe flirting with 50 sun will set at 554 and there's your five-day forecast. Flirting with 50 tomorrow, mostly sunny, but clouds gather late in the day. And stay with us Monday for a chance of ooh, rain and maybe inland snow and sleet. It'll be windy, high 48. Tuesday, variable clouds with a chance of snow flurries. High 38, mostly sunny Wednesday. And chance of rain or snow at the coast on Thursday. Snow inland, high 35. That's your weather. Oh, I love it. 50 and sun. That's darn nice, isn't it? Yeah, for one Spring day. Is two weeks from today. Uh, we'll take it. Thank you. Still ahead on News 4. Two local teams battle it out on the basketball court at the Meadowlands. So we'll have all the sports. And they are the cat's meow. Furry felines strut their stuff at the International Cat Show. We'll be right back. On throw to the plate. Can nail a runner Jim Lairitz with the tough tag. George Steinbrenner signing autographs at 7.30 here on Channel 4, a half-hour special about his return. Third-round play at the Doral Open in Miami. All Greg Norman. He was red-hot with the putter. Here's a birdie on the 10th hole. Norman on the 11th. Another birdie. Norman for a birdie on the 12th. And on the 14th, Norman from long range for birdie. He tied his own course record with a 62. He had 10 birdies. Norman is 21 under par. He leads Paul Azinger by six strokes. The Kentucky Derby is eight weeks away, and before the first Saturday in May, the best three-year-olds will compete to be in the run for the Roses. Today, the older horses in the Santa need a handicap. And down the stretch they come. Star recruit, tough at the rail. Now Sir Beaufort on the outside. Sir Beaufort takes the lead by a head. Star recruit on the inside. Second major impact. It's going to be a long shot. Here's the finish. It's too tight. Sir Beaufort, in a photo finish, the gray horse paid $25.60 to win at the track. Star recruit was second. Major impact was third. Tonight at the Garden, a pair of top welterweights in the ring. This is a beauty. Pernell Whitaker on the scales. It's favorite to take away Buddy McGirt's WBC championship. I think Whitaker will stop McGirt short of the 12-round limit. Back at 11 with the hot highlights and the real lowdown. Carol? I don't know, Sal, I told you that I tried to go to a ball game the other night. <laughs> and what happened? And it wasn't in the cards, just wasn't in the cards. I got stuck in a traffic jam, four hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try again next year, though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
There'll be a traffic jam next, next year, year too. too. <laughs> they knew I was coming. And we leave you tonight on a note of real perfection. It's a business where the stars catapult to fame and glory. And fans can literally stock up on goodies. Ira must have written the script. The International Cat Show is open in Madison Square Garden through Sunday. Today's doings range from horoscopes for cats to exercise for older cabbies. Tabbies. <laughs> There's plenty of competition. <laughs> of course, for all these stars to show their breathing. And for any cabbies who'd like to join in <laughs> on the exercise, too. Only That's furry ones. Only furry ones. That's it for us. We'll see you tonight at 11 o'clock. Have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs>